welcome to Cross Community Church. We're glad that you are here today. Uh, in case you're wondering, we have a leak in our roof. That's not a prayer circle. So if you were going to go over there, I wouldn't do that today. You're just going to get wet. Uh, but we really are. We're thankful for what God is doing. I'm thankful to see, uh, man, it's really full in here. And we added the service this week. So uh, God is doing great things. Excited for another baptism. Uh, but I'm also excited because today we get to begin a new Series. So I'm going to introduce it like this. Uh, the term butterfly effect was coined by a mathematician named Edward Lawrence in the 1960s to describe how tiny changes on the front end of his weather models would produce wild and unpredictable outcomes on the back end. Now, when I tell you that there were tiny changes to his weather model, he likened these changes to the disturbance in the air that is created when a butterfly flaps its wings like tiny little disturbances created wild outcomes on the back end of his weather model. So much so that he began to wonder if a butterfly flapping its wings could ultimately cause a hurricane uh, because things are so interconnected. Now, the term butterfly effect, you've probably heard it used. It's come to describe any instance where small or seemingly insignificant things or events would produce dramatic and powerful results. Well, here's the thing. Over the next several weeks, we're going to be in a little bitty book in the Bible. It's known as Galatians. It's, it's stuck in the middle of the New Testament. It's only six chapters comprised of 149 verses. But this book didn't just have a profound effect in the first century when it was written, but it was this book which launched the Protestant Reformation. There was a, a Catholic priest named Martin Luther who began to study the Scriptures. And as he began to read Paul's letters and Galatians in particular, his life was transformed. He would say that he was saved by Jesus Christ. And as he began to read Galatians, it became his favorite book. He said of Galatians, I am married to it. I'm wed to the book of Galatians. And, and as he studied it, he came to the understanding that we are saved by grace alone, through faith in Jesus Christ. Christ alone. And of course, you know, Martin Luther was the one who went on to, to post the 95 theses on the door to the church at Wittenberg. And then uh, he made his stand at the Diet of Worms. Worms is a city, by the way. A diet is like a little council. And he stood before all the Catholic leaders that day and he said, here I stand. I can do no other. And thus begins the Protestant Reformation. At the time when Luther took his stand, there were no Bibles written in the common vernacular. Um, Average people couldn't read the scriptures. Only priests were able to take communion. There was this big gap in understanding of what Jesus Christ had for us. And so we now get to reap the benefits of what is known as the Protestant Reformation. We worship the way we worship today, um, looking at the scriptures, reading them in a modern translation, largely because of what Galatians did in the life of a man named Martin Luther. Now, I can't promise you that we're going to have another Reformation as we study the book of Galatians together, but I do pray that your heart is ultimately transformed, that you come to experience the fullness of God's grace, and that it transforms your life. There's this phenomenon that happens, and pastors talk about this behind closed doors, um, where people, maybe you go to, a kid goes to camp, or maybe you've been sitting out in church for a while, and people hear the gospel, and they, they don't just hear it, but suddenly it becomes real to them, and they understand, and they experience the gospel. And they will come up to their pastor after it's over, and they'll say this, they'll say these words, which is always baffles a minister. They're like, I've never heard that before. And, and of course, ministers are like, uh, yes, you have. Like, we've talked about this over and over and over. But it was the first time that they really came to understand. They experienced the power of the gospel. The gospel is not something we merely understand intellectually, but it is something that we experience personally, and it transforms our entire lives. And so my prayer is that as we look at this book your life is transformed by the gospel of Jesus Christ, that you're never the same again. Now, Galatians is an interesting book. It is a doctrinal book. 
And if that word kind of makes you feel defensive, it's okay. It's not very long. It won't, it won't be too difficult. But basically what, what Paul was doing when he wrote Galatians was he was writing to correct some false teaching that had infiltrated the churches in the region of Galatia. So Galatia is a region that exists in what's modern day uh, Turkey. And so Paul has, has been to this region. He's spoken probably to these churches, but he's become aware that false teaching has come in. And so he wrote it to combat some of the mistakes that they had made. So um, the teachers were teaching this, that we are saved through faith in Jesus Christ and that we as believers should also obey the Old Testament law. And so we should practice circumcision. You should observe the various feasts and festivals in the Jewish calendar. You should keep the Sabbath among many other things. They were adding something to the gospel. And you're going to see Paul is not happy about that. He is actually very, very concerned for them. Um, this letter is unique in that as we open it, Paul doesn't use his normal customary greeting where he spends some time offering a prayer of thanksgiving for them. Paul is going to get straight to the point. He's going to begin to correct these distortions of the gospel. And so if you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn with me to Galatians chapter 1 and verse 1. He begins by introducing himself, kind of a customary greeting in a letter. He says, Paul, an apostle, not from men nor through man, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father. On the very front of the letter, he wants to emphasize that his calling and he wasn't sent out by some missionary group of men that are like, hey, go out and do some teaching. Um, and he wants to emphasize that his gospel didn't come from men. He was sent out and received the gospel that he preached to them from God himself. He's like, these are the words of God. I'm an apostle sent by God. So you need to listen to my teaching. And he continues, not from men nor through man, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father, who raised him from the dead, and all the brothers who are with me. So some men would have been with Paul as he's writing this letter. He's just kind of opening in this greeting and introducing everyone. And he says, to the churches in Galatia. So this letter would have been circulated to all of these churches who had bought in to this false teaching. Now, as Paul begins, I told you, he jumps in rather quickly. And uh, in the beginning of this letter, he gives you somewhat of his thesis for the rest of the entire letter. He's going to clarify the gospel, and he does so by telling us three things about Jesus Christ that I want to share with you today. So he says this in verse 3. He says, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Again, that's kind of like writing the dear at the front of your letter. If you're going to write me a letter, this would be the dear Jason portion of the letter. Paul always opens his letters this way. But then he jumps into his argu argumentation. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins to deliver us from the present evil age according to the will of our God and Father, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. So the first thing that Paul wanted us to know about Jesus is that he gave himself for our sins. And I'm just going to ask you to take a minute and personalize this. If you remember, this letter was written to correct misunderstandings. And so as you hear, uh, as we walk through this series together, I want you to be questioning yourself like, hey, is this my understanding? Have I experienced this in my own life? Is this what I've been taught growing up about Jesus and about the gospel? Have I got this? Have I experienced this? So, number one, Jesus gave himself for our sins. Jesus gave himself for your sins. He died for you. It was for your sins that Jesus went to the cross. Recognition of our own sin is the first step in understanding the gospel rightly. If you aren't first convinced that you're a sinner, you're probably not going to be looking for a savior. Many people admire Jesus. They believe he was a good moral example, a good teacher. Many people have a warm affection when they think about Jesus. You know, you kind of get the warm fuzzies thinking about Jesus. You know how he healed the sick and he he fed the hungry. Jesus was a guy who he rebuked the religious leaders of his day, so you kind of like that about him. But listen, admiration and warm affection do not save us. 
Admiration and warm affection do not equal faith in Jesus Christ. They don't equal believing the gospel. We have to deal with our sin. And sin isn't just something we commit against other people. Because that's a lot of people. When you think about sin, you think, well, what kind of life am I living? How do I treat other people? And if, if, if you just compare yourself to the culture, I mean... My goodness, watch the news for a while. You can feel pretty good about yourself, right? You hear the stories and these, these terrible things that are happening in our world today, and you're like, man, thank you, God, I'm not like that, right? You know, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not going to prison this week. You know, I, things are going better in my life than for many people. I must be okay. I, I don't mistreat people in that way, and I'm not, a, I'm not a gossip. I don't participate in that backbiting at work. I don't have a violent temper. Maybe you would say about yourself, you're not abusive, you don't steal, you don't cheat. You may even genuinely care about others. Many think about sin in terms of how their sin might affect other people. But make no mistake, the person whom we sin against, first and foremost, any time we commit any sin, is God himself. And Jesus wanted to make this point, and he did so in the Sermon on the Mount. This, again, from Jesus himself, so you should pay attention. Um, he gathers some, some disciples up, some Jewish people around him. He begins his earthly ministry teaching on it, the Sermon on the Mount. And he, he, he starts with what would have been familiar to Jewish people, the Ten Commandments, right? We, even if you've been to Sunday school a couple of times, you probably know about the Ten Commandments. And so he says to them, You have heard it said that you shall not murder. And that's, that's kind of a gimme question for most people, right? Like most people in the crowd would have been like, yes, you know, I've, I mean, I've thought about it a few times, but I've never gone through with it. I've never murdered my brother. I must be okay with God, right? And Jesus continues and he says, but I say to you, if you have been angry with your brother, you are liable before the judge. You're guilty. And if that wasn't enough, he says, uh, you've heard it said that you shouldn't commit adultery. And again, many people in the crowd are like, thank goodness, haven't done that one, right? But I say to you that if you have looked at a woman with lust, you've already committed adultery in your heart. And so the question that those Jews would have had to confront as they listened to Jesus, it would have been something like, okay, so you're telling me that even if I don't go through with it, even if I don't murder the guy, even if I don't you know, actually physically have an affair, you mean I've sinned against somebody or I've sinned in some way by even thinking the thought? And the answer is yes, because our sin is first and foremost against God. If we just compare ourselves to other people, we might think that, you know, I think I've, I'm doing pretty well. But when we compare ourselves against God, against His perfect holiness, against His perfect Law, we're going to come to understand that we have consistently and habitually and grossly sinned against God for our entire lives. Even on our best days, we've fallen short. I want you to imagine with me, somebody comes to your home tonight and steals something really precious to you. I don't know what that might be for you, but everybody's got something. Imagine someone comes to your home and steals something precious to you. But the good news is they get caught red-handed. There are witnesses, there's video, whatever. Imagine if you were in the courtroom sitting there and, you know, this person that's stolen something from you is standing before the judge and the judge is like, I mean, you clearly did it, but you know, it's really not that big of a deal. I'm not going to punish you. And you don't really even need to give the stuff back. Just take it. Obviously, you wanted it. Maybe you needed it more than they did. We're just going to overlook this. You probably wouldn't think that that's a very good judge. You probably wouldn't think that justice had been rendered on that day. Or maybe take it a step further. I want you to imagine that someone came into your home and harmed someone that you loved in a deep way that you know was going to lead, lead to lasting pain for someone you loved. And then in the courtroom, the judge says, eh, not really that big of a deal. I think we're just going to let this one slide. You probably wouldn't have a very good opinion of that judge. That would not be a good judge. Here's the thing about God. He is perfect in all of his ways. He is a perfect, he's perfect in his justice. What God does because of our sin is render a just punishment for sin. He doesn't ignore it. He doesn't overlook it because he is perfect in his justice. He renders a just judgment for sin. Romans chapter 6 verse 23 tells us that the punishment for our sin, what we deserve, is 
death. And that's not a very good place to be. But here's what Jesus did for you. And here's what the Apostle Paul points out to us. He says, Jesus gave himself for our sins. As Luther read Galatians, he formulated this gospel in just a few words. And it's this, Jesus in my place. Jesus died the death that my sins deserved. Charles Spurgeon um, kind of brought up this illustration of, of someone who's in a completely dark room. I want you to imagine complete darkness, so dark you can't see your hand in front of your face, kind of dark. And he talked about um, that you could be blissfully ignorant in that perfectly dark room because you can't see of the cobwebs and the spiders and the creepy crawly things in there that might otherwise disgust you or freak you out, right? And he basically says that that's how many people walk through most of their life. It's like they're in a perfectly dark room and they cannot see the filth of the sin in their life. They can't recognize that they're a sinner. And because they don't recognize they're a sinner, they never reach out to Jesus. They never cry out to him looking for a savior. And Spurgeon went on to to point out that what the Holy Spirit does for us in his kindness is like opening the door to that room and letting the light flood in. And for the person who's in darkness, when, the, when the, the light hits the room, you see the spiders and the cobwebs and the, the awful things that are there. It is the gift of the Holy Spirit in your life when you come to recognize the depth of your own sinfulness. And it's not to condemn you. It's because Jesus wants to save you and the Holy Spirit is drawing your heart to him. Have you ever had this experience in your life? Of Jesus in his kindness, the Holy Spirit revealing the depth of your own sin. Not a person that you're like, oh yeah, I'm pretty good. Warm affection for Jesus, show up to church on Sunday. Have you ever experienced this where God revealed how sinful you are before him? Maybe you're like me. I'm a church kid. I was raised in this church. Great parents. They pointed me to Jesus. They taught me the Bible. Man, I had people in this church that invested in me my whole life. I would say this. If anybody had a chance to get it right in this life, it was me. And man, God had done some things in me. And by by freshman in high school, I started feeling pretty good about myself. I don't know if y'all know this, but I read the Bible at least once, maybe twice before I graduated high school. I was really faithful. I showed up to church every Sunday. I avoided a lot of the outward sins that a lot of people got into. And I was kind of proud of that. As I thought about my life, I thought I was pretty good. I went to church in college, y'all. Go ahead and pat me on the back when it's over. Like, I I followed Jesus the best that I could. But what I'd never really come to understand was just how utterly sinful I was. Till sometime after I was married, I engaged in inappropriate conversation with a woman who wasn't my wife. And God did not let that go. He didn't let me ignore it. He didn't let me accept it. He didn't let me overlook it. Man, the conviction of the Spirit was really powerful in my life. And God, in His goodness, He gave me the grace to confess to my wife, to my pastor at the time. Let me just tell you, that was the darkest, most painful moment of my life. When you've done something you swore you would never do, it's really hard to entertain the illusion that you're still somehow good. In that darkest, most difficult moment of my life, you know what I received from God? It wasn't his condemnation. He didn't beat me up about my sin. What I experienced more clearly than I ever had before, when I quit believing in the illusion of my own goodness, I began to see just how good God was. What God met me with was his grace and his mercy and his kindness. What I deserved was punishment for being on the floor in my closet, down on my knees, crying out to God, and just being reminded that Jesus took my place 
that he bore the punishment for that sin. He took my guilt. He took my shame. That's what Jesus did for us. And Paul wants to remind everyone at Galatia and each of us as well that Jesus Christ gave himself for our sins. He endured the punishment that we deserved, that we ultimately might be forgiven and have this relationship with God. The wonderful promise for every sinner, if that's you today, and God's opening that door and shining a light of his truth into your life, and you recognize the depth of your own sin, Romans 10, 13 says, For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord, you will be saved. The Holy Spirit graciously reveals our sin in order that he might ultimately save us. And so if that's you today, let me just challenge you to cry out to him. We are saved by God's grace alone. That's the grace effect. We don't deserve it, but he freely gives it through faith in Jesus Christ. Listen, have you ever had that moment in your life? Have you come to understand the depth of your own sin? Has has the Holy Spirit brought you face to face with the extent of your depravity before God? Have you experienced this amazing grace being applied to you? Paul reminds us as we begin that Jesus gave himself for our sins. Number two, Paul wants to point out that Jesus delivers us from this present evil age. Let's read that again. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sin, and he tells us why, to deliver us from the present evil age. Now, y'all, I've got to make another confession to you. You, You'll probably be even more surprised by this one than you were the other. Um, I am not a very hip person. um, Matter of fact, I am the opposite of whatever hip is. I was uh, practicing this before our staff on Thursday, and as they listened to me say these words, they said I need to go a step further and just go ahead and confess that I'm pretty lame. I, I don't have, I'm not very fashionable. I don't keep up with trends very well. And uh, the older I get and the older my kids have gotten, the more I realize um, that, that I do not have the drip. I ain't got no riz. I, at my best, I'm not even mid. That's who Jason is. I'm not very cool at all. But some of you guys, even as adults, you still got it. You know, like you can still keep up with fashion trends and you know all the things you need to be doing and saying. You get the words. It all works for you. Some of you guys, you're like Joey. You wear joggers and Jordans, you know, like you're really with it. Or maybe you ladies, you know the correct drinking vessel that you need to have depending upon like what era we're in. And so you started with a Nalgene and then you upgraded to the Yeti and now you got the Stanley. Like you're killing it. Like you keep up with all the trends. I I don't do that very well. And and listen, if that's you, I'm a little jealous. I wish I was a little bit cooler. Um, I don't, I think my kids would still make fun of me either way, but regardless, um, I'm, I'm not here to address your fashion choices or what vessel you drink out of this week. But something I do want to point out to you as people who say we're the people of God is that Jesus came to deliver us from this present evil age. And while it's, it can be a good time to kind of jump on with, with the, you jump in the current of culture with regard to how we dress or the, you know, the, the things you drink out of or all sorts of outward things, let me warn you against just jumping headlong in with culture when it comes to, to what is true and what is right and what is good. And just as we're influenced in the kind of cup we're going to drink out of or the kind of clothing we're wear, we'll wear, we have to be really careful that we're not influenced with regard to what we say is good or right, or true. Jesus came to deliver us from this present evil age. Now, if when Paul wrote this letter, uh, the Galatians were to conclude that they were living in the midst of an, an evil age, if their present age was evil, we can certainly understand that ours is as well. Like you look around you, there's probably things that alarm you. And you, you watch the opening of the Olympics and you're like, what is going on in our world? Listen, we should conclude that this present evil age, or that our present age is evil. Like, this is not one in which we just get to coast, just kind of go with the flow, and we're going to be following Jesus. As a matter of fact, if the age is evil, and you're just going with the flow, you're not following Jesus. Like, Jesus called us out of our culture to be his church, like to, to be set apart and holy and to follow him. What Paul tells us here is that Jesus gave himself for our sins to deliver us from the present evil age 
according to the will of God, our God and Father. And here's what this means. It is God's will that we leave our sin behind. We just, we just got to see a baptism. And it is a beautiful picture of what happens in the life of a believer when we come to faith in Jesus. And so what, what that pictures for us is that we are identifying with Jesus Christ in his death. Like Jesus was, went to the grave. We're, we're identifying that we're not the, the man or the woman that we once were. We don't live that pattern of life anymore, right? We have died to that old person. And we have been raised up to walk in newness of life. We are new creations in Christ Jesus. Jesus died to deliver us from this present evil age. And what Paul is inviting us to do, what I want to invite you to do, is to leave your sin behind. And there are sins that our culture, are, like it, it's totally normal. And things have changed quite a bit, even from when I was a kid, right? There are things that are socially acceptable now that would have never been acceptable when I was a kid. You know what's socially acceptable now? Greed. As a matter of fact, you get a new truck, but you can't afford, your neighbors are going to come over, fellas, they're going to show up, they're going to lean on the, the bed of the truck, they're going to kick the tires and be like, man, it's a great truck. They're going to celebrate you, even if that truck makes you neglect your family. They're going to celebrate you, even if you can't afford that thing, because you've got another, a, another possession, you've got something bright, you've got something shiny. But rather than living lives that are consumed with greed and materialism, Jesus has called us to contentment in him. To not love the world or the things of the world, but to love God instead. And if we're not careful, and we'll just kind of jump into that river, go with the currents of culture, and never realize that we're in the midst of sin, and we're okay with it. Another thing has to do with our sexuality. And our culture now, it's anything goes except for biblical sexuality, right? So when I, I first started in ministry, every now and then someone would come to us, and as a question we might ask in like this rare setting of, what do we do with a couple who's living together before they're married? And it was a rare thing. Do you know what it is now? It's the norm. Because culture says, hey, when you meet someone that you like, just go ahead and live with them for a while. You just try it out. You know, you can sleep together. You know, whatever it is. Don't worry about getting married. And yet, what the scriptures call us to is a one-man, one-woman relationship for life. Like living and sexuality practice in the context of that one-man, one-woman relationship. So what I want to invite you to do today, because of the grace of God, is to leave your sin behind. And don't accept it. Don't ignore it. And don't embrace it. And instead, leave your sin behind and turn and follow Jesus Christ. The gospel, when we really understand it, not intellectually, but we experience it, it transforms us. We become new creations. It is God's will for you to leave your sin behind. Jesus gave himself for our sins and he delivers us from this present evil age. And then the final thing is that Jesus gets all the glory. Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins to deliver us from the present evil age, according to the will of our God and Father, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. You and I were created for God's glory. Jesus died for us to save us for the glory of God. He delivers us from this present evil age for the glory of God. But you know what I have a tendency to be? A glory stealer. Whenever things go well in my life, I, what I want to do is just step in front of that spotlight and be like, well, of course it's going well. Do you know how hard I work? Did you know I read my Bible twice before I graduated high school? Did you know, like, and I want to take credit for the good gifts that God has given to us. And this is no lie. Recent meeting I went to, I was really nervous about it. You know, when you get to have a meeting with someone and give them good news, it's like, that's never hard. Like, they, everybody loves to hear that. But there are times where I have to have difficult meetings and deliver difficult news. And I remember the lead up to this meeting, I'm just praying that, that God will do something. Like, I know that I can't 
I can't speak in such a way that's going to make this easy to hear. It's not, it's probably going to go bad. And I'm praying, God, would you please do something? And y'all, I went to that meeting and I had that conversation and it went awesome. Like it was so good. And I'm walking out of the door and you know what thought popped into my mind? I thought, this is embarrassing, but it's true. Man, I'm a pretty good leader. You know, like I, I totally just, just did that, stepped into that, like I did, I did really well. And then God immediately was like, really? You think that was you? You know, we often want to do with our lives. The good gifts that God has given us is we, wanna, we want the glory to be pointed toward us. We want to think well of ourselves. But when we understand the depth of our own sinfulness... The extent of our own inability, what we don't do is step in front of the spotlight and be like, look at me. But instead, what we should do is point people back to God. There is a life that's lived in many, the lives of many believers. It's a life of legalism, where rather than focusing on and giving glory to Jesus, we focus on us. Legalism says, how well am I doing this week? Am I checking all the right boxes? Am I devoting daily? Check. Yep, must be doing good this week. Did I gather consistently? Check. I'm doing really well. It's a life of legalism that can creep into our lives if we're not careful, where the focus is all on us. Am I trying hard enough? Am I doing well enough? Am I giving it enough effort? Am, am I good enough to be acceptable to God? And the problem with that is it's always focused on us. And so when we're failing, man, we're carrying shame. I've got to do better. When we fall flat on our faces in sin, man, I've got to improve. I've got to get this fixed. I, I, I. But you know what the gospel tells us? When we're flat on our faces, when we've fallen into sin, the gospel tells us that Jesus died for that sin. The legalists, when they're doing pretty good, like they're, I mean, they're reading that Bible. They're doing all the things they're supposed to do. You know what they have a tendency to do? Look down on others who aren't doing quite as well as they are. Those people who fall into those sins, right? We get self-righteous and we look down on other people. But the gospel says that it was Jesus who delivers us from this present evil age. It's all his work. And rather than being self-focused like the legalists, we are supposed to be Jesus-focused people who are giving him glory for every good thing in our lives. Can I ask you a question? Are you living a life where you consistently point back to Jesus? A, a life of constant gratitude for the good things that he has done, for the gifts that he's given to you? Are you thankful for the gospel which rescued a wicked man or woman like yourself? That God has adopted you and made you his own? That he's rescued you from this present evil age and allowed you to walk in victory over sin? Are you living a life of gratitude and giving glory to God? Or are you just really focused on yourself? The grace effect is this. We stop living the old lives we once lived we come to understand the gospel. Our lives begin to be transformed such that we no longer think about us, but we now put the focus on Jesus. Can I ask you a few questions as we bring this to a close today? Has there ever been a time in your life where that door got open, the light of God's truth began to shine in, and you recognized the depth of your own sin? And as a result of realizing how sinful you were, you realized how much you needed a Savior? And if that's happened to you today, I would love to visit with you more about how to follow Jesus and about the gospel and what it means to, to just give your life to him. Have you had the experience in your life where Jesus has delivered you from the sins of this present evil age? And rather than living like you once did, your heart is transformed. It's not you killing it, just working so hard every day, but Jesus has begun to transform your heart, in James chapter 5, 16, he tells us to confess our sins one to another and pray for each other so that we may be healed. It may be that in this time of invitation, what you need to do is just make a commitment. I'm not going to leave this place before I confess my sin to somebody. Maybe you're that person and you've been wrestling with this sin for far too long. And you've been letting it go on and on and on. The prescription we're given in scripture for seeing our sinful condition being healed is confessing our sins to someone else and asking them to pray for us. So maybe that's your step today. And if you're here and you've just been living for your glory, 
and life's been about you. And today I want to invite you to confess that. To confess it to God that you've stepped in front of the spotlight, you've made it about you. And just to spend some time in gratitude thanking him for the work that he's done on your behalf. Would you bow with me? Lord Jesus, we thank you for this letter that you inspired to the Apostle Paul 2,000 years ago, sent to a people in, in modern-day Turkey. But Lord, that your word is living and active, and God, that it still applies to us today. Lord, I pray for the person here who maybe they, they, they think they believe in you. Maybe they think they've been saved because they're in, involved with church, but their lives have never been transformed. Lord, would you give them eyes to see and ears that hear that they may understand the gospel and experience your salvation. For the man or the woman who's caught up in sin, and they're, I mean, it's, they, they, they try, they try to get away from it, but they haven't been able to, to free themselves. God, may you, by your power and your spirit, set them free from the sin that's, that's, that's entangled them. God, for the glory stealers like myself, would you help us to walk in humble gratitude for you every single day of our lives, not living for our glory or focused on our goodness, but Lord, instead living for your glory and focused on your goodness. We pray that you would have your way in our church in this time. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Right now, I'm going to invite you to